Now, after the uh, the voice, uh, you kind of went national. You had your uh, uh, exposure nationally. You had the cover of uh, uh, the Mother Jones. Jones, and uh, well, what was it like? In essence, the first Mother Jones piece was pretty much laying out the river, rivet head character again. Was it a reworking of material you had already done, or was it a new piece? Well, it was a new piece that. Uh, uh, you know, borrowed from some of the best of the rivet head, mm -hmm. but it was sort of capsulized. Obviously, I couldn't put every article I ever wrote into mm -hmm. this cover story, so I sort of capsulized the best of it and gave a overview. And they did put it on the cover of Mother Jones, Mike Moore's first issue uh, in 1986. Mm -hmm. 86 was a wonderful year yeah. for the rivet head. What was it like? Often, for one thing, let me ask you about one thing first before we get into the whole thing, because okay. a lot of stuff happened. With the cover, all of a sudden you had a visual image. Now, a lot of times, through most of the voice stuff, there weren't a lot of pictures involved with that. The Riverdad was kind of a, you know, a, a, a character in, in the mind. It wasn't a real person. And with your face and picture on the cover, then you sort of embodied the rivet head now. I mean, you were, the, I assume people referred to you as the rivet head. Uh, did, was that a change, having your face all of a sudden become uh, part of the story? It was definitely a change. And uh, uh, one I don't think I was really up to in 1986. It, all this stuff just took me by total surprise. I mean, I used to just get a kick out of, like every third week going to the phone and beat somebody, you know, asking me, you know, it'd be Wall Street, you know, they did a cover story on me and uh, 60 Minutes came to town. That turned out to be a complete uh, debacle. Uh, 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 Esquire magazine <laughs> uh, put me up as one of their uh, top achievers over the un or under the age of 40 for 1986, which at the time I told my friend was uh, a big signal that the end of Western civilization was upon us. <laughs> yeah. Any time that, like me, could be, you know, con considered or construed as one of the top achievers of anything, you know, let alone the world or whatever they were talking about. So '86 was really a, a, a wham bang year for the rivet head, and I really wasn't prepared for all of that. Mm -hmm. I really wasn't. Uh, what was the hardest part of it? I think trying to do my job and also try to meet the obligations of these people who were calling me. Uh -huh. Because, you know, I didn't want to say no and I'd realized these were great opportunities, yeah, you know. Yeah. You know, if Esquire calls you, you know, Harper's Magazine call me, you know, write an article. Mm -hmm. And the Wall Street wanted to do, a, do an interview. The Village Voice came to Flint to do an interview. NBC Today show did a, a segment on me. You know, those are things you don't turn down, you mm -hmm, know. Mm -hmm. Yet I still had to put in nine hours a day, six days a week over at the truck plant. Mm -hmm. And it got to be a bit of a sort of a Jekyll and Hyde type thing, you know. I'd hop from one character to the next. Mm -hmm. now, I got to be the rivet head now, you know. Mm -hmm. And now I got to be Ben Hamper, you know, the slouch that the foreman, you know, is always hitting on the head. Eh, you missed another rivet, you know. And I'm thinking, oh. So, you know, it was disturbing in that fact. But uh, you know nothing that uh, I I regret. Mm -hmm. 